It was a quiet Sunday afternoon in the Southern Hemisphere, but 20 miles beneath the surface, the Nazca tectonic plate had been locked against the South American continent for centuries, building pressure like a coiled spring. Then the rock snapped. The resulting release of energy was not just an earthquake, it was a magnitude 9.5 mega thrust event the largest seismic event in recorded history. While the ground in Chile churned like water, a second silent threat was already moving. The shaking was only the catalyst. The true danger was racing across the Pacific Ocean at the speed of a jetliner. To understand the scale of what happened that afternoon, you have to look at the days before. The Earth had been warning Valdivia. Just 33 hours earlier, on May 21st, a magnitude 8.1 earthquake had struck near Conception to the north. That event alone would have been the disaster of the decade for most nations. It severed telecommunications and sent the region into a panic. But seismologists now understand that this was only a foreshock. It weakened the fault line, unzipping the tectonic lock and setting the stage for a catastrophic failure further south. When the main shock arrived the following afternoon, it did not stop after 30 seconds or a minute, as most earthquakes do. The rupture lasted for 10 terrifying minutes. The crust of the earth tore open for nearly 600 miles, stretching from the Araco Peninsula south to the Kiloe Archipelago. This was not a localized tremor. It was a planetary realignment. The rupture velocity moved at two miles per second, unzipping the fault line and releasing centuries of accumulated strain in a single violent event. The shaking was so severe that gravity seemed to lose its hold. Witnesses described a rolling motion that made Made it impossible to stand, a sensation less like being on solid ground and more like being at sea in a violent storm. The violence was so extreme that the landscape itself was redrawn. This was not just surface damage, the tectonic plates had physically shifted. Along the coast, the ground subsided, dropping two meters instantly. Forests that had stood for centuries were suddenly submerged, turning into saltwater marshes that remain to this day. In Valdivia, the soil liquefied. Concrete buildings, rigid and unable to flex, collapsed into rubble. 40% of the city's structures were destroyed. The Valdivia River, choked with debris and landslides, briefly flowed backward. But as survivors in Chile assessed the rubble, the ocean was already reacting to the seabed's massive displacement. While the dust settled over the ruins of southern Chile, a different kind of physics was at work in the Pacific. The earthquake had been a mega thrust event, meaning the oceanic plate had shoved the continental plate upward. This vertical displacement did not just move rock, it pushed a massive column of seawater toward the surface. When that column collapsed under gravity, it generated a tsunami. In the deep ocean, this energy is deceptive. The wave travels low and fast, often invisible to ships passing overhead. A captain sailing over the epicenter might have felt nothing more than a confused swell, unaware that a disaster was passing beneath his keel. But the energy was moving at over 400 miles per hour, the cruising speed of a commercial jetliner. It radiated outward in an expanding ring, targeting coastlines thousands of miles away. Its first major target beyond South America was Hilo, Hawaii. The distance was over 6,000 miles. It took the wave 15 hours to cross the abyss. At 1.04 in the morning local time, the ocean receded from Hilo Bay, sucking the water out with a terrifying hissing sound that woke residents who had not heard the sirens. Then it returned. A wall of water 35 feet high smashed into the dark coastline. The shape of Hilo Bay acted like a funnel, trapping the incoming energy and amplifying the wave height. The destruction was absolute. The wave did not just flood the town, it scoured it. Parking meters were bent parallel to the ground, frozen monuments to the water's force. Massive chaotic machinery and buildings were ripped from their foundations and tumbled inland. 61 people died in Hilo that night. The tragedy in Hawaii was compounded by a failure of communication and understanding. Warning systems existed and sirens had wailed for hours before the wave arrived. But the science of tsunami prediction was still in its infancy. Many residents believed the danger had passed after a smaller initial wave, not realizing that a tsunami is a train of waves and the first is rarely the largest. Others simply did not understand 
understand that an earthquake in Chile could threaten them half a world away. As Hilo mourned, the wave continued west, undiminished, racing toward coastlines that had felt no shaking at all. The wave continued its march across the Pacific, invisible in the deep water, relentless in its momentum. It crossed the international dateline, moving into the next day. Nearly 22 hours after the earth shattered in Chile, the tsunami arrived in Japan. This delay highlights the terrifying math of the Pacific. The shock wave moved faster than the warning systems of the era could process. On the Sanriku coast of Honshu, fishermen were preparing for their morning work. They had felt no tremor. The ground beneath their feet was stable. The sky was clear. They had no reason to suspect that an event on the other side of the world was about to kill them. But at roughly three in the morning local time, the ocean surged. It was not just a high tide. It was a violent, chaotic intrusion of the Pacific into the Japanese mainland. The waves, reaching up to six meters in some inlets, battered the coast and destroyed homes and infrastructure that had survived the war just 15 years earlier. 140 people died in Japan that morning, victims of an earthquake that happened 10,000 miles away. The destruction was not limited to Japan. The Philippines took a heavy blow, with casualties reported in coastal villages. In Alaska, water levels fluctuated wildly, tearing boats from their moorings. This is what makes a megathrust tsunami so insidious. For the victims in Hilo, Kamishi, and the Philippines, the arrival was silent. There was no rumble in the earth, no swaying buildings to signal danger there was only the sudden, inexplicable rise of the sea. It was a phantom killer. The energy released by the Nazca plate was so immense, it did not just cross the Pacific, it rang the planet like a bell. Tide gauges as far away as the English Channel recorded the disturbance. In Argentina, lakes high in the Andes began to slosh back and forth, creating standing waves called seiches, driven purely by the seismic energy passing through the continental crust. The planet was vibrating, but back at the epicenter, the crisis was evolving. The Earth earthquake had broken the earth, and now the earth was threatening to drown what was left of Valdivia. In the mountains above the ruined city, the earthquake triggered massive landslides. These slides did not just move dirt, they reshaped the hydrology of the region. Debris slammed into the outflow of Rinihu Lake and effectively dammed the San Pedro River. The water had nowhere to go. The lake level began to rise rapidly, threatening to burst through the earthen blockage and send a catastrophic flood down into the valley, directly toward the surviving population of Valdivia. This became known as Raniwazo. The stakes were absolute. For every meter, the water rose. 20 million cubic meters of volume were added to the reservoir. If the dam broke, nearly half a billion cubic meters of water would scour the city from the map. The response was a desperate feat of engineering. With modern machinery failing in the mud, 27 bulldozers were bogged down and useless. The Chilean government mobilized a manual workforce. Led by engineer Raul Saez, thousands of workers, soldiers, and engineers waded into the muck. Armed with little more than shovels and determination, they dug a relief channel by hand to lower the water level safely. It was a race against gravity, fought in the aftershocks of the apocalypse, and the earth was not done. 38 hours after the main shock, stress on the crust triggered a volcanic eruption. The Cordon Calais volcano, dormant for decades, exploded into life, sending ash and lava into the sky, a final fiery punctuation mark to the disaster. But from this chaos came order. The failure to warn Hawaii and Japan forced the international community to act. The Pacific Tsunami Warning System was overhauled, creating a network of sensors and communication protocols that watched the ocean 24 hours a day. Seismologists revised their understanding of subduction zones, realizing that faults could rupture over much larger areas than previously thought. The data gathered in 1960 remains the benchmark for planetary power. It taught us that the Earth's capacity for violence exceeds our imagination. The geological scars, the sunken forests, and shifted coastlines remain visible today, a permanent record of the moment the world changed.
May 22, 1960, proved that a single geological moment can redraw maps and alter lives thousands of miles apart. It destroyed the illusion that any coastline is truly isolated from the ring of fire. If the Nazca Plate can send death across the ocean, so can others. To see where this might happen next, and why the Pacific Northwest is ticking toward its own catastrophe, watch this video on the Cascadia Subduction Zone.